It's Hanukkah, so let's talk about Hanukkah, coming up on In Focus. It's the fourth day of Hanukkah today, and I want to talk to you about this holiday now as we are in the beginning of the third month of what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has referred to as our second war of independence. This war began on our last major holiday, Simchat Torah, uh, with a one-day Holocaust. And uh, I want to begin my discussion of Hanukkah at this time in our history with a quote and I'm going to give it to you now, um, and tell me who you think it comes from. Well, I guess you can't tell me, but guess. Guess who you think said this, and when. Here's the quote. We didn't take a foreign land, and we didn't exist on the spoils of other nations, but on the lands of our fathers, and through the years, that through the years was illegally seized by our enemies. We, when we had the opportunity, we restored our birthright. Again, we didn't take a foreign land, and we didn't exist on the spoils of other nations, but on the land of our forefathers, that through the years was illegally seized by our enemies. We, when we had the opportunity, restored our birthright. So who do you think said that? It wasn't Netanyahu, and it wasn't David Ben-Gurion. I'll give you a hint. It was, or actually, I'll just give you the answer. It was Shimon HaMaccabee, Simon the Maccabee, the last survivor of the five Maccabee brothers who fought the Greek Empire led by, at the time, the Seleucid tyrant Antiochus. Simon said this, Shimon said this, 2,158 years ago to an emissary of Antiochus who came to him and demanded that he and his warriors return the lands that they had seized from the Greeks including Jerusalem. And this was Shimon's response. You seized it from us, we're taking it back. I think the fact that Shimon the Maccabee said this 2,158 years ago brings, ver brings to bear very clearly the fact that there's really nothing new at all about what we're experiencing today. As Ecclesiastes said, of course, there's nothing new under the sun. And one of the unfortunate uh, characteristics of the eternal war against the Jews is that it eternally involves people denying that the Jews are a civilization, that we're a nation, that we have a history, that our history is here, that here the land of Israel is our land. They seize it illegally from us, and then they claim that we're interlopers in our own land. This was going on, again, 2,158 years ago with the Greeks happened um, with the Romans who blotted out the name of our land, Judea, the land of Israel, and changed the name to Palestine uh, to resurrect a people, the Philistines, that had been destroyed 700 years earlier to try to pretend away and erase uh, the Jewish people and the history of the Jews, and the Jewish homeland from the face of the earth. So I think it's very notable that at this time in our history, when we read the words of Shimon the Maccabee, and this, uh, just so you know, this is quoted from uh, the first book of the Maccabees, chapter 14, verses 33 and 34, if you want to look up the source. I think it's very notable that Shimon the Maccabee's words today, the Hashmonai, uh, are so relevant because it shows, again, that the claim is being made against the Jewish people today like the ones that the Greeks made against the Jews 2,000 years ago, are the same. They're the same. This is the same war. And Hanukkah celebrates or remembers or commemorates this characteristics, this enduring characteristic of uh, the destiny of the Jewish people, that we're destined to constantly be fighting for the truth, fighting for our rights, fighting for our history, fighting for history by telling our story, retelling our story, inculcating it in to the hearts of our children, and celebrating the victories that we've had against not only tyrants, but also liars. 
Here's another aspect to the Hanukkah story. It's not just that we defeated the Greeks, but we also defeated the enemy from within, the Hellenized Jews, the Jews who were happy to participate with the Greek overlords in the erasure of Jewish civilization in the land. And these were the, you could call them the progressive Jews of that era that were politically correct, that were interested in getting along with the glitterati of the day, with the cool guys on campus, with the popular crowd who all were driven or um, seduced by the easy payoff of Greek mythology and of poly, polytheism, polytheism um, and bowing to other gods because it was a lot easier than keeping a distance and maintaining faith with the heritage of our Jewish people. So for instance, who was the high priest in the temple of Jerusalem that profaned it? His name was uh, Jason. He took on the Greek name of Jason. I think that his Hebrew name was Jonathan, and he changed his name to Jason to fit in. And he thought it was okay as well to sacrifice two Greek gods. And they said that in his time, uh, often there weren't enough junior priests to carry out the sacrifices at the designated times because they were at um, Greek uh, sports uh, conferences like the discus competition, which they thought was more important to participate in or to watch than to actually perform their functions at the at the uh, temple in Jerusalem. So we had that. We had serious profanities on the part of the, the Jewish leadership, the glitterati. You had such profound self-hatred and such a desire on the part of so many of the of the banton of the of the of the elite of the land of Israel of the Jewish uh, of the Jewish people in those days to fit in with the Greeks that you even had these crazy pseudo medical procedures of uncircumcising boys and you can imagine both how painful and how terrible that uh, that procedure must have been because it's um, it's painful and it mutilates the body and all that in order to fit in because at the Greek gymnasiums where everybody hung out together, they all hung out together nude. So the Jews who had been circumcised at eight days did want, didn't want to stand out in a crowd. And so they were willing to undergo this horrible uh, mutilation of their sons in order to have them fit in with the cool guys uh, in in the in the Hellenized Greek uh, community and with the with the Greek overlords, um, and you know we're seeing a modern day version of this playing out among progressive Jews, where you see today on a daily basis you have the glitterati of the intellectual set and the political set and the social set in Hollywood on campuses. Um, in the corporate boardrooms of very, very wealthy Jews, donors, the Soros type, who say that as a Jew, they are embarrassed of the Jewish state, of the Jewish people. They want to fit in with the progressives. They redefine Judaism. If they redefined it in the time of the Maccabees to essentially be Hellenized uh, polytheism, polytheism and rejecting everything that's sacred in Judaism. I mean, I think the high priests were, the Antiochus required them to eat pork in public, um, and those who didn't uh, were killed. Um, Matitiao Matthias, the father of the Maccabees, was a high priest, and he refused to make a sacrifice to uh, the Greek gods, and then he killed the Hellenized Jews who came forward to uh, make the sacrifice when uh, when Matthias refused to do so. So, you know, it was a major civil war among the Jews, between the Jews who wanted to remain Jewish and the Jews who were the elites in the society in the land of Israel at the time who wanted to become Greek. And today we see this very clearly in academia with Jewish professors, with Jewish administrators, uh, the president of MIT who has transformed MIT into just a fount of anti-Semitism is a place where Jewish faculty and students are systematically intimidated. I saw 
Um, you can see here in this video, uh, here's this poor math teacher trying to teach uh, matrix to his students and he is being intimidated and then has to stand down in the middle of his lesson uh, so that a bunch of goons from uh, Students for Justice in Palestine or whatever they're from can disrupt his class, block him from teaching and his students from learning uh, math, the subject, the content of the education that the parents of these students are spending $100,000 a year to get them a degree from MIT. In. So you see this intimidation. And here I want to give you an example of a Hellenized Jew of our time. His name is Ari Kelman. He's a professor of Jewish studies at Stanford University at their School of Education. In 2017, I wrote about it, uh, a couple of articles at the Jerusalem Post at the time, that Ari Kelman had overseen this research where he uh, carried out a, uh, a survey of uninvolved Jewish students at five, I think, California universities to see what they thought of the allegations that there was anti-Semitism on the campuses. So this was not a random sample of Jewish students. This is only Jewish students who are not involved in any way in Jewish student life. So that's the first X. And then the second one is that they feel very uncomfortable about Israel. Okay, so that means that they're um, not interested in being uh, Jews and they're not uh, supportive of Israel. This again makes them a minority among the Jews. And he went out and found this very non-random, non-representative sampling of Jews on California university campuses. And then he asked them a series of questions, the purpose of which was to say that these Jews uh, don't see any problem with anti-Semitism on campuses in University of California. And this was at a time back six years ago when anti-Semitism was already a massive problem, not only in university uh, campuses in the state of California, including his own Stanford University, but throughout the United States. And there was copious, massive mountains of evidence showing that it was institutional anti-Semitism was coming from below, from these anti-Semitic student groups and from above, from administrators who were enabling uh, the open calls for the genocide of the Jews of Israel on college campuses with no limitations, even the same administrators who think that we live in a world where the smallest infringement on the comfort level of whatever student who belongs to a protected group that, of course, is not Jewish, uh, is immediately punishable by expulsion or by ostracism or by what have you. So Kelvin came in, produced this research with a non-representative, non-scientific sample of Jewish students in University of California campuses in order to claim that there's no anti-Semitism uh, on these campuses. And then that was used by anti-Zionist Jews who then gave testimony before a congressional panel on anti-Semitism to say that there's really no problem with anti-Semitism on campus. So it was used, this Stanford uh, research research was that was put out by this very political, very anti-Zionist professor of Jewish studies at Stanford University. Okay, now fast forward six years to now. Pre if you remember after October 7th, there was a lecturer, I think, at Stanford who made all of this Jews who were students in his class stand in a corner and be ostracized so that they could feel like Palestinians this was right after the slaughter of October 7th. And I think he was fired. But Stanford has a huge problem with anti-Semitism. So following all of this anti-Jewish activity, President, I'm just reading, President Richard Saller appointed three leaders at Stanford to advise him on anti-Semitism on campus. Ari Kelman, Rabbi Lori Hahn Tapper. The two of them are co-chairs of the newly created anti-Semitism committee. And Steve Zipperstein is a special advisor. Uh, and he made this announcement at a Stanford town hall on November 16th. Funny thing about all three of these members of his anti-Semitism committee is that they are all supporters of BDS and of Jewish Voice for Peace, which the ADL, which is not some sort of conservative organization by any stretch of the imagination, the, the ADL has determined that Jewish Voice for Peace is an anti-Semitic organization. 
So they're all three members of this anti-Semitic Jewish Voice for Peace anti-Zionist group, and they are all supportive of the anti-Semitic BDS movement. And they are the ones charged with handling anti-Semitism on college campuses, on Stanford University campus, okay? Um, and all three very clearly understand that their job is to be today's version of the high priest in Jerusalem, Jason, who was happy to make sacrifices to the Greek gods uh, in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. So this is the fight that Jews have internally. How do we handle these Hellenized Jews of our time, these progressive Jews who are making common cause with people who want to blot out everything meaningful about a Jewish identity, whether on campuses or just in our own lives, right? And that includes very centrally uh, this, the relationship that the Jewish people have always had since time immemorial that's been denied since time immemorial with the land of Israel. And that brings me to the second uh, thing that I want to talk about, or the second text that I want to read to you. I didn't tell you in the outset that I want to read you a second test, text, but here it is. It's the last will, essentially, uh, in Testament of uh, Staff Sergeant Ben Zussman. Ben Zussman uh, was uh, in the recon unit of an engineering corps uh, reserve unit. He's 22 years old. Uh, that was fi that is fighting in Gaza. Uh, ben and a comrade of his were killed in battle, uh, face to face, hand to hand combat with Hamas terrorists in northern Gaza on December 3rd. And um, his and I think uh, yesterday, um, this letter that he published that he wrote to his family. Uh, that really is a, serves as a, a sort of a will, uh, was published. And uh, uh, I translated it into English. And this is, I just want to read it to you, because I think it's pretty remarkable. This 22-year-old uh, reservist, combat soldier, combat engineer, Ben Zussman. This is what he wrote. I'm writing you this message on the way to the base. If you're reading this, something must have happened to me. As you know, there's probably no one happier than me right now. It wasn't just that I was on the verge of fulfilling it wasn't just that I was on the verge of fulfilling my dream soon. I'm happy and grateful for the privilege of protecting our beautiful country and the nation of Israel. Even if something happens to me, I don't permit you to sink into sadness. I had the privilege of fulfilling my dream and destiny. And you can be sure that I'm looking down on you with a huge smile. I will probably be sitting next to Grandpa. We'll fill in the gaps. Each of us will talk about his experiences and what has changed between the wars. Maybe we'll also talk a little politics. I'll ask him what he thinks. If God forbid you sit Shiva, then make it a week full of friends, family, and fun. Bring food, meat, of course, beers, juice, nuts, tea, and, and of course, mom's homemade cookies. Crack jokes and tell stories. Meet all my other friends you haven't met yet. Truth, I'll be jealous of you. I would have liked to join and see them all. And another very, very important point. If, God forbid, I fall into the hands of the enemy, alive or dead, I absolutely do not give my permission to negotiate any deal to release me. I do not allow you to harm even a single soldier or citizen as a result of an exchange deal. I do not allow you to conduct any media campaign or anything like that for my release. I do not allow any terrorist to be released for me under any conditions in no way, shape, or form. Do not defy my wishes. Please, let me say it again. I left my home without even being called in for the reserves. I am full of pride and sense of purpose. I have always said that if I die, I want it to be in defense of others, in defense of my country. And he closes by quoting the words of a, the chorus of a very uh, famous song, Jerusalem, I have placed my guardians on the walls. One day I will be one of them. 
So far, over 100 of Israel's greatest men have passed and have been killed in combat in Gaza since the ground operation began. The threat to Israel has not really diminished. In fact, it's growing, particularly in Lebanon. Um, our, everybody, all the wise men say that it's going to take at least until the end of January for Israel to gain control of Gaza. There are now questions about whether the Americans will let us continue fighting. Uh, there were a bunch of articles in The Economist and Politico saying that uh, President Joe Biden has ordered Israel to complete the ground operation in Gaza by the end of the month. Well, I don't know what that means, um, what he thinks is going to happen on January 1st or why that is an important date to be bearing in mind. But whatever, I guess it's an election thing. Um, but, uh, you know, we have an existential war on our hands and it's, uh, we still haven't gotten to the most dangerous part of it, which is the war in Lebanon. I wrote about uh, the clash, the coming major clash, or really maybe we were, it's already upon us between Israel and the Biden administration in relation to Lebanon. It's uh, on uh, JNS.org. You should look at it. But in short, and something that I spoke about as well last week, um, the United States, not to put too fine a point on it, but their position is aligned with Hezbollah, is not with Israel, because they're trying to prevent a war at all costs. And the problem is that under the status quo ante on the border with Lebanon, um, Hezbollah poses a mortal threat to all of the Israeli communities along the border. There are 60,000 Israeli internal refugees who have been removed from their communities uh, because it's too dangerous for them to be living in their homes right now because Hezbollah can come in and take them all hostage or slaughter them uh, with the way that the balance of forces is now uh, stands between uh, Israel and, and Hezbollah on the border. Um, we've, I think, uh, deployed 100,000 forces to the border, and uh, right now they're basically serving as a force to block an invasion. But it's not an offensive position, and uh, those Hezbollah forces have to be destroyed. It's going to be a very, very difficult war because Hezbollah has 150,000 ballistic missiles and others pointing directly at Israel. You know, after the Persian Gulf War in 1990-1991, when Israel was attacked by ballistic Scud missiles from, from Iraq, from Saddam Hussein, he shot over 50 missiles at Israel, even though we were completely not involved in the war, um, just because... Um, the Knesset passed a law that said that every new apartment built in Israel after the war requ was required to have a safe room inside, like a uh, bomb shelter, a reinforced room where people could uh, be safe when Israel was under missile attack. So every apartment that has been built since 1990 has a safe room in it, or 1991. Interestingly, after the 2006 war with Hezbollah in Lebanon, what was popularly known as a second Lebanon war, um, the international community, the United States, the UN, everybody gave billions of dollars for reconstruction in South Lebanon. They always rebuilt the homes of our enemies. Anyway, so they rebuilt South Lebanon and Hezbollah, of course, was in charge of it because Hezbollah is in charge of Lebanon because there is no state of Lebanon. It's um, Hezbollah uh, missile base. It's a, Iran's forward terror base and it's war to annihilate the Jewish state that has a couple million people in it. So that's, that's Lebanon. But anyway, so Hezbollah oversaw all the reconstruction with all this international money. And what did they do? Well, if we have protected rooms to protect Israelis against missile attacks, they have missile rooms to attack Israel with missiles, right? So all of the new apartments that were built in South Lebanon after 2006 have a dedicated room to launch missiles at Israel from, right? So that, that's, that's Lebanon. That's, the, that's what we're facing. And they have, they have enough missiles to basically um, destroy up to 20 kilometers inside of Israeli territory while their ground forces come in and seize territory in the western and upper Galilee, right? They have precision-guided missiles that are capable of hitting every spot in Israel. Our, our um, Air Force uh, bases, our mobilization centers, our major highways, everything they can paralyze the country. So obviously in a 
situation like this and in a climate like this, this can't be allowed to stand any longer. And the United States absolutely want Israel to allow it to stand, to reach a ceasefire, to give sovereign territory to Hezbollah uh, in exchange for them not opening this massive war against us, when the obvious thing that we have to do, hopefully with American support, but I can't imagine that that'll happen, is actually carry out a preemptive attack so that we can shape the battlefield and avert the kind of damage that they're capable of causing us, really damage that is poses an existential threat to our very existence. Because if they carry out the damage, if they enact the damage that they're capable of, then it's going to be very difficult as a practical matter to see how we win this war. So we're facing this threat. We're in the middle of this war. We have to fight it. And we see the quality of the people in this country, people like Ben Zussman of Blessed Memory, we lost another seven soldiers in the past day. All of them is another businessman. And I think we can, I want to move here to what Ben's mom, Sarit, said at his funeral at Mount Herzl Military Cemetery, because I think she spoke really uh, to the country and and for the country. She opened her eulogy for her son by talking about how much she loved him and what a wonderful boy he was and what a great young man he had become in his 22 years. And then she says, addressing the public, she says, we will prevail. We don't have any other option. We are people that values life, not like our vile and wretched enemies cowards, Nazis, and their allies who sanctify death. We will live, we will prosper, we will build, and our leaders must be worthy of us, of the Israeli spirit that pulsates within each and every one of us, of the Israeli spirit that pulsates within our amazing soldiers. If our soldiers succeeded in putting themselves aside and putting the nation in the center, it is only fitting that our leaders do the same. Leaders who don't understand this, leaders who walk around with a sense of arrogance should step aside and make way for those who know what to do, because we must prevail. And then she says, are you listening, people? Do you hear me, world? Do you hear me, you vile enemies who lust for death and evil? Am Yisrael Chai, forever and ever and ever, standing tall with our heads held high, now more than ever, let's strengthen ourselves, let's believe, let's demand good, let's insist on the good, and we will prevail. This is a mother who's burying her son. You can see where he got it from. Hanukkah is not about giving gifts. It's about preserving Jewish life. It's about defending Jewish civilization and preserving it, and it's about fighting enemies inside of the Jewish people and outside of the Jewish people that want to blot out the light of the Jewish people, of Jewish history, of the Jewish law, of the Jewish state. We are now in the midst of a great battle to preserve all of these things. And it's almost poetic that we find ourselves now in the height of battle and before a great portion of this war has even really begun. And we mark it on Hanukkah because it shows, just as the words of Shimon Maccabi make clear, that our struggle is ongoing, it's eternal, and the ways of our enemies are also eternal. It's just our destiny to fight it each generation in its way and in its time, and this is our time to do it. So whether you're watching me in Israel or you're watching me abroad, understand that this is the task of our times, to fight the battle that the Maccabees fought 2,100 years ago and to win it. Thanks very much. I'm Israel Chai. Stay in this space. We're going to have a lot more material coming up this week, and uh, we'll go through it all together. Thank you.